Hello, everyone. Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations. Welcome at our um, meeting as usual uh, Tuesdays. Uh, it's Zoom the World series. We do it together with the, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Poland. And today we would like to talk about Afghanistan, Afghanistan deeper, to understand what's the situation today in this country and how we should maybe handle it, how we should, we, the West, European Union, and Poland, how we should look at this situation. We have also some Afghans, refugees, already in our countries, uh, Poland and other EU countries, so we'll also talk about that. Let me welcome our guests. First of all, um, Ambassador of Afghanistan to Poland, Mr. Tahir Kadiri. Tahir, welcome. Thank you so much, Marujata. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, His Excellency Tahir Kadiri is a very experienced diplomat. He also, before coming to Poland, he was uh, posted to uh, India, uh, New Delhi, and um, he's uh, not. It's not a long time you are working in Warsaw, uh, in Warsaw, right? From Warsaw. I've been here for been almost one months. year. Yes, I'm very newcomer. One year. Thank you for being with us there. And Patrick Kugiel. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Good morning. Patrick is my dear friend and colleague from um, the think tank world. He works in the Polish Institute for uh, International Affairs, PISM, and he covers um, uh, cen Central, Eastern, South Asia, Asia generally, but he specializes in India. So um, hope to, um, to bring all the, your knowledge to this uh, conversation as well. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let me start with the, with the ambassador. Tahir, um, first question goes to you. Um, how would you, what can you tell us? I know not everything has to be said or can be said, but what can you tell us about the whole evacuation operation, which was quite a, an important one and, and a difficult one? Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Malgujata. Very um, my great greeting to Patrick as well. I think so this is such a timely time, and I thank you really for doing this great webinar um, uh, as the country is going through, you know, a transition. Um, the evacuation overall, of course, um, uh, I think you know it has it had its pros and cons. But at the end of the day, one thing that we all agree was that you know the international community. They all did their best to help their Afghan friends and allies in need. Um, so if I particularly speak about the evacuation of the Afghans to Poland, which I was a very small part of it, um, I think it was very successful. As a result, um, Poland evacuated around 1,000 Afghans, most of whom had worked with the Polish mission over the last 20 years. But on the other hand, also some Afghan friends of Poland uh, that uh, who were at the risk uh, and they were vulnerable. So as a result, over the last, you know, for something, you know, um, a few flights, they were evacuated here in Poland and most of them are reside, residing here now. Let me just tell uh, the audience that we don't have, the, Poland doesn't have anymore the embassy in Afghanistan. So the operation was basically coordinated by our embassy in New Delhi. Uh, and it was quite a complicated uh, operation as well. Of course, for the West, it was a surprise, uh, generally for the public opinion, what happened, that it happened so quickly. We were all expecting uh, something to happen in Afghanistan once the Americans decided to withdraw and all the allies as well after 20 years. However, it was a surprise. Patrick, if I can ask you, um, was it any um, any idea among the you know, think tankers that this uh, change of the government will happen so so quickly? And in your opinion, what really happened? Why uh, why uh, the previous government in Afghanistan didn't really fight? Thank you very much. Uh, I must admit I haven't come across any analysis or forecast that would. Uh, predict the, the situation, what just happened. It was uh, absolutely a surprise for everyone around uh, Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan, for international partners, for uh, experts, and also for Taliban. I think that they were also surprised that they won the victory so uh, smoothly and easily without uh, having to fight hard in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, what, how I read it, what happened, uh, was to my understanding, it signified that Af Afghan people had just enough of fighting for the last 40 years that there was ongoing war 
in Afghanistan and, and people just had enough of this. And once the Americans and international partners left Afghanistan, uh, then many local commanders and, and, and governors and uh, even president of Afghanistan uh, decided that it's better maybe to surrender uh, and to, to try to negotiate with Taliban rather than continue fighting. So to me, it just signifies that, that, that uh, Afghans were desperate for peace and for uh, end of war that was ongoing. Obviously, there are also very technical reasons why uh, happened what happened. Uh, certainly, you know, by withdrawing not only American troops and international troops, but also private contractors who were running uh, all the sophisticated uh, weaponry that the uh, Afghan army were uh, taught to use, but they couldn't do this independently without external support. So they, they, they just lost the advantage on the battlefield against the Taliban. Uh, and the, the fight became more, more hard for them. There were also problems with uh, you know, the loyalty towards the Afghan government uh, based in, in Kabul. So there was a number of, of, of reasons that contributed to this very uh, unexpected uh, uh, end of the uh, Afghan, uh, of the Taliban offensive. Uh, but to when we look at, uh, at it now, it seems like, um, well, it, it happened and it's obvious it had to happen. But earlier, I remember many talks we had also with Tahir uh, that we were counting at least months, if not longer. So uh, Tahir, if you can tell us how, what do you, what do you say to the people if, if they ask you what really happened? Well, uh, thank you. I think it's a very, it's a $1 million question. But before uh, getting to that question, I would like to, regarding the evacuation, I forgot, I, actually, I wanted to add, I thought that we would continue talking about that as well. But let me thank, you know, the uh, Polish government and those who were involved, the brave Polish soldiers, and, um, you know, the embassy, uh, Pol uh, Polish embassy in India, the MFA here, and all other authorities, the prime minister's office, the president's office, that they actually generously, they took part in it, in this great evacuation that as a result of it you know we were all um celebrating when the thousand afghan more than 1000 afghans you know they arrived here so that was a quite a success so i would like to thank and of course we sent an open letter as well to uh, the polls uh, in general to thank them for that regarding the second one um you know the how and why factors um, uh, uh, are i think the um Something that I, not only as an official, but as an Afghan citizen, I don't have, I have answer for that for now. So what I would say is that we have to wait. I think, you know, uh, in the course of history, uh, a lot of things uh, uh, will be quite clear. What I do know, um, Malgorjata, if you remember, we had a chat, an informal chat with each other in a restaurant, and I was telling you that, you know, Afghans are resilient, which, you know, of course, again, it doesn't really, um, undermine that resilience that Afghans have. On the other hand, the bravery of the Afghan soldiers and the Afghan army, I think that is something which everyone you know, talks about that, um, the 300,000 Afghan troops and especially the commandos and all that. But again, the how and why factors, I think Patrick you know, pointed out a few things about Afghans having uh, had enough of fighting. That is true. But I think while we all appreciate it, um, and respected the decision of the world to withdraw their troops from Afghanistan. At that point, if you remember, I had told you that we really want that to be condition based because there are a lot of things that the Taliban, they have to promise that they will respect which as we can see today, unfortunately, they're not being delivered. It's starting from the women's rights to human rights, to freedom of expression, and to a lot of other stuff that while the country may have some sort of, you know, relative peace now, but unfortunately, uh, the gains that we have achieved over the past 20 years, uh, or, and, and one generation of Afghanistan, they are in a state of shock and despair. So that's why I think I would not comment about how and why, because history quite soon will, I'm sure analysts and think tanks, they will get into the nitty gritty of what really happened and why it really happened. But what I do, uh, what I can tell you is that we as a nation, 
Um, we have fallen a lot in the past as well, and we have stood up again. And I think this is not the first time. This won't, this won't be the last time. Um, um, there are many fronts of resistance in Afghanistan now. The woman who takes to Kabul street, despite knowing that she will be flogged, but she raises her voice. I think that's, that is a new Afghanistan and a resistance that we always talk about. The Afghan students who have been deprived of taking an education, unfortunately, I think they are you know, raising their voices. And I'm sure when you see the clips, um, of these young children, you know, taking to social media. So I, I think now that the, the time is like, what, what can be done? So because something has happened, all right. So we, I, I'm sure that, you know, history will tell us what happened. What, okay, what happened. so let's let's stop here. I, I understand I just, that I... you have also your limitations as a diplomat, but I want to say, you know, one positive thing maybe for your country is now that everyone speaks about Afghanistan. We somehow, you know, the West a little bit forgot maybe, about this beautiful country, and now um, absolutely everyone is um, is looking at this part of the world and asking ourselves. We are asking ourselves what will be next, what will happen next. So, Patrick, if you can tell us now, with the Taliban government in Afghanistan, um, what is this repositioning, you know, of the neighbor um, states, especially India, which you cover uh, with specific attention, but not also at the whole region. And how would you judge on, on the reactions on the neighborhood countries, on the government, how to handle this shift of power and what will be their uh, relations with Taliban government? Okay, but before I uh, come to this, let me just add a few words to what Ambassador said regarding the, 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 the change of, of government. I agree absolutely with Ambassador that one of the major reasons uh, why uh, uh, the Taliban uh, took over the power was this unconditional withdrawal of international forces. Uh, and one major mistake, uh, detrimental decision that was made in recent past was the agreement in Doha between the United States and, and Taliban. You consider it as, as a mistake? Absolutely. If, if we wanted, if we wanted to have a democratic Afghanistan, then uh, it was not achieved at, at, during the negotiations in, in Doha. We absolutely, we, we, American president just surrendered democracy in, Af, in Afghanistan and got almost nothing in return for withdrawing international fo forces, which only boosted the moral uh, and, and, and strength of Taliban. So only thing they had to do was to wait until the, 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 the half of this year and then uh, prepare for the uh, last offensive. And they just took over the, 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 the Kabul. It's true, everyone was uh, uh, expecting that the, the, the 300,000 security forces, strong security forces of, of Afghanistan will hold uh, on for a couple of months, it, 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 they didn't, but uh, government in Kabul just lost the psychological war with, with, with the Taliban. They were... Just to add to you, because your statement could be controversial to many of our viewers, of course, Donald Trump, when he was a president, started the negotiation and then they, they concluded under the Trump administration, the negotiations in Doha, but Joe Biden once took over, the office didn't change these decisions, you know, continued the approach also because of the pressure of the American people who are also tired, who were also tired after 20 years of being engaged in this place. And Joe Biden mentioned also about priorities for the American people now and for the America as a country. So from the American perspective, maybe it was a rational decision to withdraw. True, I, I agree. It was rational from our point of view. But I, what I'm just trying to say is that uh, we in the West, in the U United States, in, in NATO countries, we just accepted uh, this eventuality that Taliban will eventually uh, to, uh, take over the, the power in Kabul. We all hoped, uh, and politicians hoped, they, 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 uh, that Taliban will uh, uh, be somehow uh, forced to, to engage in political negotiations and to share power with the democratic forces in Afghanistan. Eventually, they took hold of power and, and, and uh, had no incentive anymore to, to share the power with anyone and to uh, keep some um, elements of democracy in Afghanistan. 
But so, Patrick, you were an expert on and uh, about the region. You covered the region. Do you really think if uh, forget um, the army in place, U.S. Army and the Allies didn't want to be there with the army? But do you think it is really uh, feasible? Um, hoping that um, in this place, in this part of the world, this Western approach to you know the, the governance, to the relations between the government and the people could really find the, 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 the real deep base and grow? You know, nation building is very complicated and, and tough uh, and, uh, exercise. Yeah? It's, 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 it, it needs a lot of year of engagement, uh, at least three or four decades to be present in a country if we would like to you know, build it from, 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 from the scratch. And if you want to build this, the, the country in faraway country in different culture on, that would resemble the Western liberal democracy, it's even uh, more complicated. So, so how I read it is, you know, this is uh, the, the time that you need and resources you need and, and presence you need for a long time to, to build a nation uh, is incompatible with the short uh, uh, cycle of democratic elections in Western countries. So because you were saying just simply that 20 years was not really enough. enough. Let me just yeah. get back to Tahir, because I will, uh, of course, you will answer my, my, my question in a minute, but I have to give the floor now to Tahir. Tahir, you yourself, you are a relatively young diplomat, not even 40 years old. Um, uh, we can say quite, you know, um, I don't know what the word uh, should be used, but uh, very much also westernized and, you know, working with um, Western diplomats as well. How would you comment on what Patrick said? Well, thank you. I, I think, well, it, it, of course, I mean, she, Patrick, I respect his uh, comments about what he just talked about and his analysis on Afghanistan. But look, uh, Malgujata, what we did really, we wanted to engage with the Taliban. If you remember, you know, our 21 um, member delegation, they went to um, uh, Qatar, to Doha. And they stayed there for months, uh, which was very inclusive, and that represented different walks of society. We even had, you know, um, a member um, representing the young generation of Afghanistan. We have a couple of late ladies as well. We had, you know, people from political parties. So our whole hope was that the Taliban would agree to some sort of political settlement. All we were saying there was that, look, we can share power, but you have to acknowledge and recognize the realities of Afghanistan 2021. Because when you left back in 2001, Afghanistan was a totally different country. Now that you come there, there is a new generation that they don't even know what war is all about. Of course, they have heard the suicide attacks, the kidnappings and all that, but they don't know about you know, this nature of war. So that's why let's you know recognize and acknowledge all that, but on the other hand, let's share power to um, bring an end to this 40 years of war in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, even the Doha agreement, when you look at it, you know that the United States signed with the Taliban, that was not respected by the Taliban. Part of that was actually that they would you know, share the power. They will respect inclusivity of the Afghan, uh, uh, of Afghan community. You know, you guys have been to Afghanistan, you have been covering Afghanistan. It's such a diverse country that no one um, group single-handedly can rule Afghanistan. And, and you can see now, you know, the results of it, the Taliban and all the, pre uh, and all the implications of what is happening there. Um, look, I, as not only as an Afghan official, but as an Afghan citizen, I appreciate the sacrifices that all the international society, like 50 plus countries, they made to Afghanistan to bring all those democratic values to, you know, uh, lay the foundation of democracy in Afghanistan. That as a result, my generation, that we call it the generation of after 2001, we cherish all those values, same like you do here in Europe. You know, women's rights, for example, for the first time, women were allowed to work outside. 27% of our parliament was composed of women. A lot of women, more than 6,000 of them in the Afghan uh, security forces. Hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of them working you know, as civil servants. 10 million kids, half of them uh, girls going to school. 
a lot of universities, 150 media uh, outlets in Afghanistan. I think these were some of those great achievements that you sitting here in Europe, me as an Afghan, we all cherish that this only happened with the sacrifices. So what will happen with all this now? Under I, I will just tell you, this all happened with the huge alternate sacrifices of the American, British, um, a German, Polish, 44, you know, all these people sacrificed their life to bring all those great things for Afghan people. So now the biggest question um, uh, uh, is that why we do appreciate the, the decision of the international community, but now I think there are two things that we see the way forward. Of course, whatever happened in Afghanistan was very unprecedented, even for me sitting here. So number one is how we can prevent Afghanistan changing into a safe haven for international terrorists. Because when, like even previously, um, uh, during the, um, uh, uh, like let's say a couple of months ago, we used to say that there are 21 terrorist groups operating in Afghanistan. Afghanistan could plunge into, you know, a drug trafficking place because um, uh, I'm sure you know that Afghanistan, you know, produces, I think, majority of the opium in the world. So that is, you know, a, 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 a risk there. So in order to do that, I think, you know, that is that that should be a number one priority. Number two is how do we protect whatever we have preserved, so what, what, whatever we have gained so far? For example, 10 million kids, imagine Malgorjata, you sitting here, like my sister cannot go to school today. How would I feel after 20 years? My nephews cannot go to school, for example. What can how we... would she feel as exactly, well? Exactly, how would she feel? I mean, when my brother can go, but my sister cannot go. It is a total discrimination. What about, you know, the, all the teachers, the female teachers, half of, you know, the teachers in Afghanistan, they are female. What about the civil servants? Because we have at least one million civil servants in Afghanistan. Half of them were girls. If, if not off, at least 30% of them were women. So what happens to them? So that's And also we have to mention that most of these people stayed in Afghanistan because they, the evacuation operation... Of course, they're all in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Because, um, because you know, you could not evacuate 35 million people. You know, when, when some uh, foreign friends, they talk about evacuation, I say that we do appreciate, but let's remember one thing, that Afghanistan is a country of 35 million people, 75% of them are under the age of 35. So that literally means that after 2001, a generation has been raised in Afghanistan who are very well connected and who are very educated. So now it is a nightmare for all of them living you know, under an absolutely dark era, which you are not allowed to listen to music. You are not, the women are not allowed to go outside and work. Several servants are not allowed to go outside and work. So that's why I think, you know, that the international community now um, uh, has got two responsibilities. Number one is to prevent Afghanistan getting into a terrorist heaven. Number two is how do we protect all these gains plus the human rights, women's rights, and also humanitarian assistance, Malgorjata. Let me, let me uh, emphasize here. It is quite important. As I'm speaking now, 18 million Afghans are struggling with having no food. So there is a catastrophic crisis happening in my country. And, and I would like to thank, of course, the international community that recently they um, uh, donated uh, $1 billion, but that is not enough, you know? Okay, Dahir, you put very right questions before you give them some answers also. Maybe Patrick can back, be back to the question I put. What was the reaction? What is the reaction actually of the neighborhood countries we, who are absolutely the most interested in in, con in controlling somehow, you know, the, the, this process, because there are a lot of um, a lot of processes which can happen against their interests, like massive migration, like uh, uh, terrorism, who can spread out, and many other things mentioned by Dahir as well. So, Patrick, if you can just uh, make a picture for us of this reaction of the neighborhood countries. I think there are some slight differences in approach to Afghanistan, certainly in the neighborhood, but they do share this huge uh, concern regarding the stability of Afghanistan and, and the impact, negative impact uh, the developments in Afghanistan can have on their, uh, on their own countries. As you said, terrorism is uh, certainly number one threat that they all share in the neighborhood. Uh, that Afghanistan will once again became a safe haven for terrorist organizations and will organize, uh, you know, attacks in, in China, in India, in, in other countries. So this is shared concern by all neighbors of Afghanistan. 
humanitarian crisis or refugee outload, you know, possible outcomes of, of any eventual civil war, new civil war in Afghanistan would be disastrous for the region. So this is in their shared interest to help stabilize Afghanistan and to engage the new uh, Afghan or Taliban government. So, because they, they, they have so much to lose. And uh, uh, so, so they will deal with wh whoever is in, uh, based uh, in, in Kabul. For that reason, you, you can also see the differences in approach to, 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 to the Taliban. I think, you know, China or Russia uh, were expecting what just happened for many years uh, already. And they prepare themselves for the change of government in Kabul. That's why uh, they are these days uh, more favorable towards the new rulers in, in Afghanistan. They engaged uh, the Taliban already. They left their embassies working in, in Kabul. Uh, you have Chinese, uh, you have Russians, and you have Iranians uh, still present diplomatically in, in Kabul. Uh, but so would you agree on this uh, thesis, which we discuss also among political scientists, that you've just mentioned Russia, China, and Iran. All these three countries are not really friendly with the U.S. That the U.S. also wanted this to happen. It wanted to leave Afghanistan to them, this problem to them, to be able, you know, to, 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 to push more engagement, but also more problems to these countries who, uh, with the, from the U.S. perspective, uh, now could be more, you know, focused on the, the problem in Central Asia than on the other things, which will give the Americans more time. I think we are just getting dangerously close to, to some conspiracy theories. But so I, I, I didn't think, you know, Americans just uh, invented the, the inv invasion in Afghanistan 20 years ago just to leave the, the chaos and, and, you know, the problems uh, behind for China and other uh, countries in the region. But you are right, the result of, of uh, Americans withdrawal from Afghanistan will be the problem, the headache for Chinese and Russians and other in the neighborhood. Now it's their responsibility to largest extent to help stabilize the country, to, to enhance security, to, to, to make Afghanistan governable and you know, normal country to some uh, extent. So this is their obligation. They have the most to lose, uh, and they have little to gain in, in the foreseeable future. But but uh, you know they have enough incentives and in interest to be uh, cautious about what's going on in Afghanistan and to engage Taliban. That's why you have heard the most uh, positive uh, you know calls, appeals to international commun community community coming coming from Be Beijing, yeah, and Islamabad and from Russia, they, they presented, the governments they presented some kind of uh, quite positive attitude towards the new government because they just want to have the relationship with new Afghanistan to put on a stable footing yeah, and to secure their own security interests and, and possibly to start normal economic cooperation. And if I may ask you about India, because that's the country you cover, um, uh, you know, the most, and uh, the country, uh, India seems to be really the only power in the region, which is able to closely work with the Americans, and, you know, be kind of intermediator in the further engagement of the, the Western powers in the region. Uh, India is a neighborhood country, India has to react in this situation, even if the Americans or the Europeans um, are far away. So what would be the approach of the of Delhi government to this, um, this situation? We know that uh, foreign minister of India was quite engaged also with the talks with Taliban before all this uh, started. You know, the, the, the current mood in, in Delhi is to some level extent similar to what's going on in other capitals in the neighborhood in South Asia or Central Asia. So this is, they all took this wait and see uh, approach. Uh, and maybe other governments are more uh, positive towards Taliban and India is less positive about uh, engaging Taliban. But nevertheless, they just want to, to wait and see what the situation, how the situation will evolve in the future. 
India was heavily involved, engaged in Afghanistan for the last 20 years. It has very friendly governments uh, in Kabul. It was providing uh, huge development assistance. It was, you know, providing uh, scholarships to Afghan students. And thousands of Afghans who have been studying in India and you know, India was, was heavily engaged in, in Afghanistan. Uh, India um, was not talking to uh, uh, regarding Taliban as a terrorist, and they didn't want to to engage them with legitimacy. So now they have very little connections with with with, with Afghanistan. Even though the positive development is only this, I, the last sentence that uh, uh, leaders of the Taliban uh, reassured Indians that they weren't friendly, even with India, and they, they like a poor opportunity for India to engage, but India will regard, follow the Western democracy in their approach to, to Afghanistan. That's something please here. We have to consolidate our efforts um, on uh, making consensus, regional consensus, that everyone should believe that peace in Afghanistan is peace for the region. So that's why now, you know, I think it is a wait and watch situation for many countries. And they're just watching out what, what next for Afghanistan, because the problem is that the Taliban, of course, they had a lot of promises, but we don't see that in action. For example, allowing the girls not to go to school, allowing female civil servants not to work outside, the, you know, flogging the protesters and all that. I think these are some serious questions that a lot of countries quite concerned. As I'm speaking, Malgojata, I don't know if you read yesterday, the Taliban, they um, set up and established one of your suicide bombers units in uh, Badakhshan province of Afghanistan. I think that is quite alarming uh, for, it should be alarming, I think, for many countries, because, you know, you literally, you are, you know, establishing a suicide bombing unit, which ultimately that is not good uh, for the stability and peace of the region. So that's the reason that we say that it is too early to actually get into recognition of any government that is not delivering actually and respecting the human rights, women's rights and all that. So I think um, um, a number one priority for all of us at this point should be how do we assess the Afghan people in need, especially the humanitarian crisis, that's number one, and then putting pressure through many platforms on the Taliban to respect and protect the gains that we have made. Um, otherwise, Afghanistan is literally changing into a resistance. You know, every corner, every street of Afghanistan is now a resistant front, including, of course, what happened to Panjshir. Uh, I'm sure you guys were following, unfortunately, that there is a humanitarian crisis and catastrophe. And the BBC's recent report shows that a lot of civilians were shot there. Um, uh, did, uh, uh, and unfortunately, the humanitarian you know, uh, uh, assistance was blocked to gate to Panjshir. So I think what the international society at this point should do, put more pressure on the Taliban, forget about the recognition at this point, because it is too, too early. And, um, and, and I think Afghans are you know, waiting for their international allies to see how they decide in terms of both the humanitarian aid, but on the other hand, uh, protecting all the values, we the shared values, in fact. We, we wouldn't call it that Afghan values. We say the shared values, that as a result of the um, engagement of the international community, a generation, you know, has, has been educated. So we shouldn't leave, we shouldn't leave all that in vain. The good thing yes. is that there is widely shared consensus regarding what we want from Afghanistan what we want from Taliban. And this is consensus shared in the region and internationally. We had the UN Security Council resolution on 30, on last day of, of uh, August. Uh, and we had uh, just yesterday the, uh, the decision of five permanent members of the Security Council. We had the declaration from the Shanghai Organization uh, on co of cooperation. And we have many, you know, signals from different parts of the world, from the Euro European Union to, from European Union to, to China to India, and the, the, so the expectations are the same. We all agree that we want inclusive and representative government in Afghanistan, and we all want Afghanistan uh, not to become a safe haven for uh, terrorism, terrorism or terrorist activities against any country. So this is 
good beginning, I, I guess. You know, the, the, there is wide uh, universal uh, agreement on what we expect from Taliban. The problem is, however, that we don't know how to enforce this, this how to, 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 you know, to realize these uh, conditions and expectations. Uh, because we have very limited options these days and, and, and very limited leverage on or influence on, on Taliban. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the government they presented, which was neither uh, inclusive nor representative, also uh, showed us that, you know, th there will be a difficult partner, the Taliban. So, so the, 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 the real question is how we can influence Taliban in order to preserve the gains of the last 20 years, human rights, you know, questions on, on terrorism or drugs, and et cetera. And this is really a tough question. And, 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 and this we need to uh, you know, think again, how it's better, how it is better to, to engage Taliban. Uh, we need to pressure them more or maybe to engage them more, hoping for uh, their socialization into the international community. Tahir, do you have any answer to this question put by Patrick from your side? Well, I think I put my concerns um, uh, very clearly that Afghans are very worried. Um, Afghan, uh, as I said, I mean, we have, uh, our people have lost a lot overnight. And, uh, but that's not the end of the day, of course. I'm not saying that, you know, people or the people have lost everything, but they are, you know, disappointed, but they will get up again. And as you can see, today's Afghanistan is not the Afghanistan that the Taliban left in 2001. Would you even believe, Malgorjata, you yourself sitting here in Europe, that an Afghan girl, right after two days after the Taliban take over, they would take to the streets to protest? I wouldn't. I mean, I would, but many people wouldn't. Because they were saying that, no, I mean, they, they are quite concerned. They are afraid of the Taliban. Women are being flogged on the streets, but they take to the streets. You, we had a, a Ministry of Women's Affairs. Unfortunately, that has been now absolutely con converted into the Ministry of punishment vice or, or, or virtue and vice, something like that of the Taliban, which, uh, you know, again, that is not, uh, you know, um, a, a, a delivery of the commitments that the Taliban have to protecting the women's rights in Afghanistan. So I, I think for me, um, sitting here, the priority is how we lobby for the international community to actually extend more humanitarian aid to my people. I think that should be number one, because as I said, 18 million Afghans are um, uh, uh, struggling uh, with uh, 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 food stuff. And uh, of course, you know, they don't have access to that. So a humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding in that country. That's number one. Number two is, I, I agree with Patrick that there should be I think we need to use a lot of platforms, different platforms, international platforms, how we should how we should put pressure on the Taliban to accept and acknowledge that Afghanistan of 2021 is not Afghanistan of 2001. And then there comes again the um, issue of legitimacy and formation of a government which should be legitimized, you know, not only by the world, but by, by Afghans as well. Because you cannot rule a country literally, I mean, uh, 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 that, that people don't accept you. People don't acknowledge that. People don't recognize you. It's not only about- But that's the question I would like to put to you, uh, Tahir, because, uh, well, the fact is, um, well, despite all what you've mentioned, of course, it's true, but that these Afghans who were expecting Taliban to be like it is, didn't fight against this to happen. So that's the, the, that's the challenge for us also to visualize, you know, on which base to build this consensus with whom, because, uh, you know, Taliban took the whole country also because people didn't protest. Um, so uh, if I may put this question um, diplomatically, with whom, how would you name these, you know, groups, these forces, where, where to look for these um, kind of uh, parts of Af Afghan society who really um, is able to handle this situation and share the power with Taliban in a, in a, serious, in a serious way? I think Malbuja, the, the uh, simplest answer to your question would be that you have to engage the Afghan people themselves. The Afghan people, the Afghan generation, the young generation, that they are very well connected to the international society, number one. Number two, there is a national resistance front. Um, of course, you know what happened in Panjshir as a result of that. 
uh, still Afghans were very much looking forward to forming some sort of inclusive government that you have representation from all across the country, but that didn't happen. So as a result, I think one thing which you know popped out as um, uh, as a result of that was the National Resistance Front in Afghanistan. So I would say that you know the National Resistance Front is spread across Afghanistan very quickly, and you notice that from south to east, east to north. People were taking to the streets, of course, protesting in very civil ways, uh, um, demanding their very basic rights of, you know, education, of working, of staying as peaceful human beings. I think they were quite basic ones. But on the other hand, we have got some, of course, Afghan leaders uh, who are um, uh, uh, building on that consensus, on that unity. Um, uh, I know that most of them are outside, but some of them are inside Afghanistan. They still, they're trying to, you know, make some belt some unity that they um, uh, should represent the people of Afghanistan, the well of the people. So for now, I think the international community should listen to the voices of the Afghans on the ground. Um, I think that is not, if you go to just, if you scroll down uh, the Afghan social media, you can see a lot of messages that Afghans put in English for the international community, what they really want. So I think the basic, the basic one is the right of living and education and uh, you know humanitarian assistance. But at a later stage, of course, um, I think the Afghan leaders, uh, the, the international community, uh, uh, can engage with the should engage with the Afghan leaders, um, including those who are leading the National Resistance Front. Um, uh, which is now a widespread and a, a national actually cause for Afghans. Um, uh, so I think that is that is quite important to see the other side of the story. As I say, I, I, the fact is that yes, there has been this transition um, in Afghanistan, but the other issue is that you cannot rule that country single-handedly or you know with your extrajudicial um, uh, or unconstitutional ways. So you have to listen to the Afghans. You have to listen to what Afghans really want. And I think um, that the, the time will you know, determine that. And Patrick, I want to ask you also from your perspective, you, you work as an analyst, how would you um, describe the, uh, the, the support um, among the Afghan society for Taliban and the, the support for these kind of Western um, ideas? And what would be, from your perspective, you know, the right way to, to, to act now? We said that we engaged diplomacy, we engaged, as European Union, we engaged money as well. We give the moral support. We did this evacuation action, of course, but it doesn't change much for the country it, inside the country. And you also mentioned that we have limited, um, um, how to say, space of maneuver. But what could be our scenarios? What could be, in your opinion, uh, our, you know, possibilities right now? First, it is very hard to, to give you a proper answer to the, to the first question, how much support uh, Taliban or the previous government enjoyed in Afghanistan. Uh, according to most recent service done by Asia Society in 2019, uh, the, the Taliban could count only on some 15 to 20 uh, percent of, of Afghans uh, who saw them favorably. But the, the, the survey was done on the uh, territory controlled by the government, so it was not really representative. And this is the problem. You know, we, we do not have any representative uh, service or any other way to, to, to see what... So in other majority... words, it may be uh, higher, this percentage. It may be higher, but it, it, the short answer is we don't know, and it must, and it's certainly divided. You know, 75% of Afghanistan, Afghans live in, in the rural areas. So what we see these days also, and, and recently uh, pictures from Kabul, from Herat, and, 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 uh, and other big cities, it's also part of the story, and the, there are people protesting against Taliban. But but I I uh, guess, and we have many records that uh, Taliban do enjoy true support in rural areas, especially in the Pashtun uh, parts of the country inhabited by Pashtun, and also in other areas. Yeah, there, there was a great disappointment with the uh, government of Ashraf Ghani. There was a huge outcry against the corruption in the government. So people in the countryside, they didn't even uh, really uh, benefited to a large extent from, from the you know, 
democracy and from the presence of international community. So I think there are divided voices in Afghanistan, and this is uh, it would be very difficult to to hear what Afghans in majority uh, really uh, feel at the moment. Uh, there is very strong and visible part of this uh, young people, educated, more liberal, who really feel disappointed and 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 who really uh, believed in democracy, and and they uh, they might be outra outraged uh, at the Western. You know, countries who left them behind, and 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 we must take care of them. Certainly, uh, we must continue the evacuation of Afghans who feel insecure in, in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Uh, that's one thing. We must uh, uh, put a pressure, keep a pressure on on Afghanistan at international fora to. Uh, to fulfill their own promises, what they said in the early days when they captured Kab Kabul. Uh, but we must also definitely continue uh, international financial and development assistance to Afghanistan, regardless who is in control of Kabul. Because we, we uh, own this to the Afghan population, not to the Taliban, okay? We might dislike Taliban. Uh, that would be very difficult also for politicians in the West to, uh, you know, give money to Taliban, to, uh, to Afghanistan controlled by Taliban, whom we fought for the last 20 years, and explain this to our own societies, why we are supporting those people whom we consider terrorists still. Uh, so this is very challenging, but I think, you know, 90, over 90% 90 of Afghans are living below the poverty line. 80, 18 million people are in desperate need of international assistance according to uh, United Nations. Uh, 12 million people are uh, in danger of you know, not having enough food to, 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 to survive to the next day. So the, the situation in Afghanistan has been for many years already very uh, difficult. And the change of government in, in, in Kabul make things worse in a sense that international support stopped. Uh, you know that the, the international community withhold the development funds and, and money to Afghanistan, which in the end of the day will uh, uh, cause the problems for normally ordinary Afghans. So I think at the moment, what is the priority for the international community is to find the ways uh, to deal with the Taliban, even we don't like them, but to to provide, to continue pro pro providing humanitarian assistance, that, that's the must. And we are doing this already. This is good news that, you know, the recent international conference on Afghanistan in, on, in Geneva, uh, world leaders agreed to provide 1.3 billion US dollars till the end of this year for humanitarian assistance to, to Afghanistan. This and is also good. because we know that from other parts of the world that if we even implement sanctions, then there will be, you know, other circulation uh, of contacts and money and support from other countries. We don't want to be too much engaged as China, for example, which is a next neighbor, I mean, of, uh, of Afghanistan. Um, uh, Tahir, if you can tell us, um, because this Af Afghan uh, people were mentioned so many times, some of them, you said over 1,000 we have now in Poland. Could you tell us a little bit more of some of these people? And maybe um, you can tell us a little bit of their expectations for the future. Well, um, uh, I think that was such a goodwill gesture of the Polish government in general to, you know, to evacuate their friends in need, and especially those who worked with them. But a lot of the people uh, who have been evacuated here um, they come from different walks of the society. Uh, so some of them I have met and I'm in touch with. They are doctors, they are engineers, they are journalists, uh, civil activists, and of course civil servants um, uh, who used to work for the Afghan government and with the international community as well. Um, I think there are some really touching stories of all those people. Recently, um, I approached, uh, I mean, I, I talked to some of them and I said, look, they, they were saying that how can we thank the Polish government? And I said, you guys can, you know, perhaps uh, record a voice and just send it 
to people here and we will you know edit it and i think you um, uh, i'm sure you have seen the clip and uh, you know in those some really touching voices of children and um, uh, the afghan community who, who have been evacuated here um uh, they say thank you in different languages to the polish government and to the poles in general for their hospitality because one thing Margojata, we we afghans and you uh, poles have in common two things we have in common one is hospitality the other one is we have this uh, element of resistance in our dnas so i think with the hospitality i think the polish uh, the people are showing their ultimate hospitality to the afghans who have been here now for days i know i'm in touch with a lot of them a lot of these um, aid organizations are giving them second hand uh, uh, second uh, hand clothes a lot of food, of course, and uh, they are trying to um, engage them and, and, and integrate them into the uh, uh, policy. And society. what are the challenges in this regard, as far as the integration of these people well, um, is, in we, the society we, like the Polish one? Yeah, look, Malgorzata, we, I mean, our people never wanted to leave Afghanistan at first stance because they always had a chance, especially, you know, the elite uh, groups of Afghanistan. They always had a chance to leave and they always had, you know, European visas, but they never left the country. So I think they are still in a state of shock, most of them, because they all they left was with a suitcase of perhaps some of them even left behind their wedding tapes, for example. You know, they couldn't get the, 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 their documents, um, academic documents. So I think um, the number one is that uh, depression that they are going through, which I think everyone is going through that. But that is, you know, a, a separate thing. But other than that, all the great facilities have been provided to them to integrate them into the society. I know that there is a lot of help for them, both from the Polish government, from the Polish people and aid organizations. I'm in touch with a lot of them, and especially with the, um, the uh, psychological, you know, um, uh, therapists. I know that some of them, you know, they were speaking with those people. A few days ago, I hosted one of the friends here in Warsaw, uh, who I know him from Kabul, and he comes from a very, you know, educated family. And I was so happy to see him, and he's already working, looking for a job. And I was like surprised. He said that I don't want to be, you know, relying on any benefits that they might give it to me because I really want to integrate myself and my children and my wife, whose uh, wife is a doctor, into, uh, you know, the Polish society. So I think, um, a lot has been done. I know that we, we, no one was expecting this. Of course, you know, we were all taken by surprise. But nevertheless, um, I think everyone is doing their share. Everyone is doing what they can uh, to integrate these people into the Polish society. And I think proudly in a couple of years time, we will be very happy to see some Afghans who are, you know, a, a part of this society contributing, you know, to a really diverse community here, uh, but uh, a lot of them I speak to, they also say that once it's peaceful, they will get back to the country because they have left everything behind. Uh, but for now, I think peace is uh, quite important for them that the uh, polls have uh, provided them with. So let me put the last question to you, Tahir. Uh, what, uh, how would you describe, you know, this moment when these people, uh, Afghans who are already in Poland and other European countries, uh, can really go back. What should be fulfilled? What should be, you know, the situation like in your home country to be able to convince these people to come back? Very, very important question, Emal Gujata. I say that my generation never wished to be living outside. And that's the reason why when you see, you know, it's a very big group of uh, Afghans, um, educated Afghans inside the country, they always had the, um, the luxury of going outside, but never did. So that's why now they didn't have any option, but actually because they were very vulnerable and they, they had to escape. And I'm sure you know the stories of many of those people, how they, you know, stayed for uh, five days over the walls in this side of the airport to get, you know, to the safer side. Uh, who are now safe now in many European countries, and I think they, they should be indebted to you know our international allies for the generosity and for, for putting their life at risk as well. For example, the Polish soldiers who you know went to Afghanistan again to actually protect these people. I think that was um, that 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 was a bravery. But um, uh, ultimately, I think the demands of the people that I'm in touch with, especially with my friends. Last night, I was speaking with someone who is living in France now. Uh, he, uh, he was evacuated. And with a lot of them in the United States, they all demand that the international community should um, put pressure on the Taliban government, on the Taliban, 
to actually protect you know the rights of the afghans to pave the way for the people to live to live peacefully so that no one is discriminated based on their base ethnicity language or whatever but on the other hand equal opportunities for everyone so that they can practice and enjoy some basic you know freedoms so i think um Ultimately, Margot Jata, I can promise you that no one really wishes to stay outside because, as I said, everyone has got a lot of assets and properties. And of course, you know, your history back in the country, you belong to Afghanistan. I mean, no matter how long you live here, um, uh, uh, they, they have to go back because they have to contribute. And there is a brain drain as well uh, that even the Taliban cannot sustain and survive because a big number of Afghans who are literally running, you know, the um, system in Afghanistan, they are, they are outside now. It's starting from the banks to hospitals to the government offices. So um, I think ultimately uh, everyone wants to get back. Everyone loves their country. We Afghans, same like you, Poles are very patriotic people. So we want to go back. Our people want to go back. But um, I think the Taliban have to deliver on those promises of protecting the human rights, women's rights and freedom of expression. And it's also, as far as we know, it's not easy now to leave Afghanistan for those who stayed if they want to. So last question, um, the short answer, please, goes to Patrick. As an analyst, I am asking you, what do you expect to happen now in you know nearest months and years in this part of the world, the most probable scenario? I think we'll, Taliban will, will continue consolidating the, their power. Uh, they will try to uh, crush the remnants of the opposition, of the resistance front, and uh, impose the uh, rules on throughout the country. And so they will limit uh, some rights of, of the people, uh, unfortunately, I, I would expect. But once the, the, the power is more consolidated and, and they might feel more secure, also I, I think that will be a space for uh, you know cooperation and for them to to give more rights yeah to, to do the people for example ambassador mentioned this ruling that uh, girls cannot go to secondary schools according to taliban if we can trust them this is only temporary yeah now boys can go to school but girls will resume education uh, in a foreseeable future, once the conditions, you know, uh, are prepared for, for for girls to come go to the school, so I think there will be some moderation and uh, uh, positive uh, developments from the Taliban in uh, in a longer future, and the international community will will keep engaging Taliban unofficially most of them. I would expect some countries to recognize uh, officially Taliban, possibly Pakistan, Qatar, or, or China, or maybe Russia uh, in few years, a few, few months time. And the West will uh, keep engaging Taliban uh, in order to provide uh, assistance in order to, order to uh, you know, enforce, uh, you know, to, to keep uh, Afghanistan safe from from uh, terrorism, yeah. So, so Taliban will not uh, transform uh, Afghanistan into safe haven for for terrorists. So, so we will be watching from uh, a, a, a side. We will exert uh, some pressure on on Taliban to to uh, preserve uh, gains and human rights of of Afghans, but uh, we will not do possibly anything uh, dramatic. We will not mm -hmm. send the troops, we will not you know, impose new uh, sanctions on, on Taliban, I guess. It will be, we'll be just waiting and, and watching what's going on in, in, in Afghanistan. But I guess if, uh, if I may end with this note, uh, that that's also an important test for the Europeans, for the European Union, because we have the soft power um, at least, you know, in this, we were quite effective. We can be quite effective here as well, not only with the financial support, but also diplomatic skills. So that's maybe the role, no more so much for the US with hard power, we were drawn, but maybe for the soft power of the West um, to um, be more engaged and to watch, well, maybe from the distance, but also to watch out whatever Taliban uh, promised if it's kept. 
because it's in our also in our interest to allow all these Afghans who had to immigrate to go back one day to their country. Thank you very much for this talk. And definitely it's not the last talk we do on Afghanistan as the situation um, evolves. Uh, so um, Ambassador Tahir Gandiri, thank you very much for your presence with us, Tahir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margot It was really timely and I really appreciate you. And of course, great analysis, both from Patrick and yourself as great friends of Afghanistan. And I think we should continue speaking because uh, this is the time. I think Afghans really expect this from their friends overseas. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I'm very optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic about my generation. As I said, we Afghans are very resilient, same like you Poles. We have this uh, um, element of resistance in our DNAs. And I think this is, I mean, I know people are in a state of shock. People are disappointed, but it won't. Uh, I think things will change, change quite soon, uh, especially with the power um, and the resilience of, uh, you know, our people and the young generation. Thank you, Ambassador, for being with us. And thank you, Patrick, Patrick Kugel, PISM. Um, thank you, both of you, and see you for the next uh, Tuesday on our um, Tuesday talks, Zoom the World, Małgorzata Bonikowska, the Center for International Relations.